Allen Lund Company has new offices in Ogden, Utah, and Indianapolis, Indiana. Check allenlund.com to reach them. OOIDA, representing America's truckers since 1973, presents Landline Now with your host, Mark Redding. An Oregon DOT plan to expand Interstate 5 isn't just the subject of a new lawsuit. It also leads to a bigger conversation about highway widening projects. The research available shows they don't really accomplish what they set out to do. Tyson Fisher of Landline Magazine helps us cover those bases. A phone feature could save a life, and in fact, nearly all smartphones are now equipped with a Do Not Disturb feature. We'll hear from a safety group that talks about the importance of enabling that feature. What's on your driving record, or more specifically, your MVR, or motor vehicle record? What's in there can potentially have a huge impact on your career and ability to make a living. I'll get some insight into the topic from David Grimes of CDL Legal. And finally... Pressure on the spot market is making rates go up. Ashley Blackford will find out how things are looking in the freight market at week 41 of the year from Brent Hutto of Truck Stop. And now, here's Scott Thompson. Thanks, Mark. We'll touch on a few stories making headlines in just a moment, but wanted to bring in Landline Magazine Associate Editor Tyson Fisher to talk about a story he's working on right now. Tyson, good to see you. Happy to be here. We're going to spend a little time in Oregon before we zoom out for the big picture here. Uh, The spark for this conversation, Tyson, stems from the Oregon DOT's plan to expand Interstate 5 in Portland. But there's a new lawsuit uh, basically trying to throw a monkey wrench in the gears there. Let's talk about the argument to begin with. Yeah, so quick background. Whenever there is a major highway project, the Federal Highway Administration has to conduct an environmental study. So there are two types of studies. There's an environmental assessment, and then there's the environmental impact statement. The impact statement is much more rigorous than the assessment, and it's only conducted when uh, a project is determined to significantly affect the quality of the human environment. So for this Portland, Oregon, Interstate 5, project, the Federal Highway Administration, they conducted the environmental assessment, and then they issued a finding of no significant impact. However, the advocacy groups here argued that the environmental assessment was flawed and that the much more detailed impact statement is required here. So, therefore, the Federal Highway Administration's approval of the project needs to be vacated and that impact statement needs to happen before they can move forward. That's what the lawsuit is claiming, right? For the most part, yes. And it strikes me, and you pointed this out um, earlier when we were talking about this, uh, it's a similar argument to what we're seeing with regard to New York City's congestion pricing plan, right? Almost... Not identical, but very similar, right? Sure. So, like, the overarching argument is, yeah, they're both they're both based on the national environment. Uh, uh, basically, there's a there's a national law that requires all these things. It's called it's the shorthand is called uh, NEPA, as was referred right, to. Right, right, right. But that's what both of those all these lawsuits are basically based on. So there are at least six, I think, yeah, about six federal lawsuits uh, challenging New York City's congestion pricing, and nearly all of them are based on a claim that, you know, the federal government violated federal law by conducting the less stringent environmental assessment rather than the impact statement. And so, obviously, the details are a bit different, but, sure. yeah, the main issue is the same, which is you went the easy route here, but there's obviously going to be major environmental impacts here. Why do we not do the more stringent impact statement? Right. National Environmental uh, Policy Act is the name of the there that there. This kind of leads us to the big picture here. Um, and we were talking about this again earlier today. And you pointed to some research out there um, that basically has found that widening interstates, expanding interstates, does not do exactly what it sets out to do. Uh, and in fact, it may actually cause more harm in some cases, right? Which is an interesting conversation to have. Right. So the whole idea that the in, the environmental impact statement needs to be conducted is based on this idea that the Federal Highway Administration, uh, they use outdated traffic models when saying that there's well, not going to be a big impact statement. So yeah, there's this thing called uh, induced demand. 
Uh, and the idea, it, it's, it's pretty simple. So when it comes to highway expansions or highway widenings, in the short term, widening the highway will reduce congestion and you know improve travel times by you know you know by spreading out the traffic. Sure, right, makes, makes sense. sense. Yep. However, uh, you know, reduced travel times will incentivize motorists to drive more. So then over time, traffic, condition, traffic conditions will just revert back to, you know, the, the same heavy congestion that the widening was supposed to solve. So it really doesn't solve any of the problems in the long term. And so there's actually like this, there's this like a nationwide movement to pretty much end the, uh, the practice of widening the highways uh, as a way to solve congestion. Uh, so... You know, but not only does it encourage driving, it will therefore, because it does encourage more driving, more vehicle miles, you know, it will also increase, you know, greenhouse gas emissions. So it's not just a traffic issue. It now comes down, it rusts back around to, you know, uh, climate initiatives and, and, and that whole part of the, uh, the whole aspect of the environmental study. Yeah, and this is, I'll be honest, this is one that I, I have a hard time kind of wrapping my head sure. around because it sounds counterintuitive, right? The fact that if you widen a highway, it's actually going to make things worse. When you explain it, yeah. it makes sense in that more people will want to take that route um, for various reasons. But uh, the research is the research here, and I think it's interesting. And we've, ta- we've talked about this, I think, before, or at least we've talked to other people about it before. But it is something that you're hearing more and more about these these, year, these it, days. It is, and there's other lawsuits in other parts of the country. So Austin, Texas, uh, I know there's one in New Jersey, uh, Davis, California. Very, very similar lawsuits by local advocacy groups claiming pretty much the exact same thing, which is there's a highway expansion project. It's not going to do what it's going to do. It's catching steam nationwide. Uh, these lawsuits really aren't going anywhere. You yeah, know? yeah. But but the the movement is still there to kind of end this practice uh, in favor of more public transit and, and stuff like that. That's what the the move is towards. Yeah, it's an interesting um, you know interesting research and interesting topic for sure. One that hopefully we can explore more in the future. Tyson, we appreciate your time, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you for having me. A few more items of note here, starting with the American Trucking Association's Four Higher Truck Tonnage Index. It declined 2.1% in September, reversing the gains made in August. ATA Chief Economist Bob Costello, putting last month's drop into perspective, said tonnage is still up since January, and while the climb up has been slow, the market is trending up, not down. Meanwhile, the percentage of CDO holders who are women is down. That's according to the Women in Trucking Association's annual report. Women now account for 9.5% of professional drivers drivers in the U.S. down from 12 percent last year. A number of factors were cited in that drop, including a lack of quality child care, safety concerns, and an aging female driver population that is now retiring. And finally, FMCSA is hosting another truck leasing task force meeting next week. The virtual meeting on Wednesday, October 30th is open to the public. This will be the second to last meeting for the task force, which was established by Congress to end predatory lease purchase agreements in the trucking industry. For Landline Now, I'm Scott Thompson. And Mark, back to you. Thanks, Scott. Do you have a news tip? Maybe you have a comment about something you heard on the air, or maybe you just have a question about something happening in the trucking industry. Email us at landlinenow at ooida.com. Starting November 1st, Marty Ellis and OOIDA's tour truck, The Spirit of the American Trucker, will be at the Louisiana Truck Show. That takes place at the Rain Civic Center and Pavilion in Rain, Louisiana. Stop in, say hi to Marty, and join OOIDA for a $10 discount. Next, Ashley Blackford finds out how a phone feature on most mobile devices might help save a life. I'll find out how what's on your driving record affects your ability to make a living from David Grimes of CDL Legal, and Ashley discusses what's happening in the spot market with Brent Hutto of Truck Stop. We'll be right back. I'm Mark Red again. This is Landline Now. Thanks for listening. Be sure to like and subscribe. If you want more content, go to landline.media to get updated news, information, and archived editions of our show. Once again, that's landline.media. Control your toll costs and eliminate tolling headaches with prepass tolls. Prepass tolls means toll volume discounts. Just one invoice for all tolls and fewer violations. Call 877-878-5970 or go to prepass.com. 
Are you tired of the IRS following you around like a dark cloud? Call 888-557-4020 and get your life back. At Truck Stop, we've built a better load board for carriers like you. Sign up today and access over 600,000 loads on the most trusted online load board. Learn why the best in the business rely on Truck Stop to make more money and start driving your profit today. It's tested and proven. Burn 2.1% less fuel when you balance all wheel ends with Centromatic. Call 800-523-8473 to get the OOIDA discount. Landline Now, welcome back. We recently marked National Do Not Disturb While Driving Day, which is an annual event that aims to raise awareness about the feature on smartphones that blocks calls, texts, and other notifications while you're behind the wheel. To talk about this initiative, Joe Young joins me. He is the Director of Media Relations for the Insurance Institute of Highway Safety. Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Now, first off, I just want to, uh, if you can tell me a little bit about what the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety is. Yes, so the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, or IHS, is a nonprofit research and communications organization. Um, We're fully funded by the automobile insurance industry, and our mission is to reduce crashes, fatalities, and property loss on the nation's roadways. Um, And, you know, we're we're also involved in another organization called the National Distracted Driving Coalition, which is a group that was put together a few years ago to really tackle distracted driving because it's such a big problem on our roadways. And so IHS has been involved with that organization, um, uh, and the coalition ended up, you know, starting to put together this awareness day around do not disturb features um, because we know that they're not utilized um, as much as they could be. Now, National Do Not Disturb While Driving Day, um, like you said, did it start, I think, three years ago, did I read? Yeah, so the coalition itself, the Distracted Driving Coalition, has only been around since 2021. And so we decided as a coalition to put together this this awareness day that we launched um, a couple years ago. And so, yeah, this was the third year that we put together this awareness day on October 17th um, last week. And it's really just all about getting the word out about these features that exist on every cell phone, um, whether you've got an Android or an iPhone or some other device, there's going to be a setting on there that that you can set up to automatically block notifications while you're driving. Um, And that can just cut down on the amount of distractions that might be um, pulling your attention away from the roadway. And of course, the the goal is to, to really get people focused on the road so that we can ultimately prevent crashes and save lives. Now, you mentioned this, but how much of an issue is distracted driving in the U.S.? Yes, yeah, so distracted driving is a really big problem, but um, unlike impaired driving, you know, there's there's not always evidence or clear evidence after the fact that distraction was part of the problem in a crash. So if you look at the official government figures, you know, they say that only about 3,300 people are killed each year in distracted driving crashes, but they've also done some research and found that the true toll is probably closer to around 12,000 people every year dying in distraction-related crashes, which puts that on par with with something like alcohol impairment or speeding, which are these other major highway safety issues. Um, and so, you know, depending on who you ask, uh, it's a, it, you know, it, it's a bigger problem. But we know that, you know, it is a big problem. It, you know, you don't have to be an engineer or a researcher to be out on the road and see that there are a lot of people looking at their cell phones or doing other distracting behaviors. Um, and we know anytime you're looking away from the roadway, that's going to that's gonna increase your chance of being in a crash. Now, I think when we hear distracted driving, a lot of people just assume cell phones, but there are other distractions that, that can, you know, impact people behind the wheel, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's really important to remember that Distracted driving existed well before the cell phone, you know, was ubiquitous. And so there are lots of things that can distract you. Everything from, you know, perhaps handing snacks to a, to a child in the back seat or, you know, even talking to a passenger, fiddling with the radio, eating behind the wheel is another one that we see. So I think that, you know, smartphones are definitely a, a big part of the problem. And so obviously this Awareness Day is meant to sort of uh, address to some extent, that particular issue, which which we've seen become a bigger problem in recent years. But yeah, it's an important reminder that there are lots of distractions behind the wheel and things can change on the roadway in a split second. So it's really important to be paying attention to what you're doing. Now, back onto this um, feature for smartphones. It, I think it's safe to say most all smartphones have this feature now. Is that right? Yeah. So this 
the setting is is uh, going to come under different names. So I'm an iPhone user. So you've got your driving focus uh, setting, which you can find. You know, if you go to your settings menu and you find the word focus and click on that, you can set up your driving focus. Um, and what I would tell people is to really spend a few minutes and set it up in a way that's going to work well for you, right? So I've got mine set up so that it'll automatically engage every time that it connects to my Bluetooth and my car, and it'll automatically go into do not disturb mode, which means that those notifications are not coming through. Calls are generally not coming through, but I, I do have mine set up to allow certain contacts to reach me if I'm on the road, you know, and then it will ring through and I can see in my dash, you know, through my Bluetooth if, that someone's calling it. And then I can make a determination whether I need to take that call or not. But I think it's really about just making sure that the setting is working well for you so that you're not going to get frustrated and turn it off on day four or five of using it, right? We want it to be something that you turn on and leave on and just don't think about. And it just helps cut out those notifications every time you're behind the wheel. Do you have any idea, like, it, um, you know, we've heard for several years, you know, to put your phone down and to not have these distractions. Why do you think it seems like people are still taking that risk and, and still doing this? I think that a lot of people, you know, recognize, and, and we know this from, from studies, that a lot of people recognize that distracted driving is dangerous, but for some reason they still do it. It's a little bit like speeding. Everyone kind of knows that speeding is dangerous, but, you know, everyone sort of admits to doing it anyway um, because people just don't think it's going to happen to them. But like I said, you know, things can really change in a split second, so it's really, really important to be focused all the time because, you know, you might be looking down and, and, and look up and realize it's too late to, to avoid a crash. And so, you know, that's that's what this is all about, just to try to take that cell phone out of the equation so that, you know, all those distractions that are around you, whether it's the radio or it's someone in the back seat, you know, that's one less distraction that, that you have to worry about when you're behind the wheel. All right. Is there anything else you'd like to add that I may have missed? Yeah, I would just add that, you know, there's been a few studies done that have looked at the, the use rates for this feature, and it's relatively low. It, it's sort of consistently around 20% of drivers are using this feature on their cell phones. So there's a lot of people out there that are, that are not um, using the Do Not Disturb settings. And we'd really just encourage them to take a few minutes to set it up. Like I said, dial in those settings so it's something that's really going to work for you and your life. You know, and, and think of it as an asset. You know, when I'm behind the wheel during my daily commute, it's kind of my time, right? And I, people aren't butting in with these notifications. I'm not, you know, constantly having to, to check and see what that ding was about. And so it sort of makes my commute a little bit more peaceful. So I would just encourage people to give it a try, click on that Do Not Disturb feature, and, um, and just see how it works for you and try to dial in those settings so that it can become a habit. Um, and it's something that's going to help you every time you're driving. And I believe one of those settings, you can actually like have a text be sent um, to let the person know that you're behind the wheel. Is that right? Yeah, that's that's a great point. Um, you can set it up so that it will send essentially an auto reply that you can you can customize. Or I think there's a you know a default that says something like you know I'm driving and I'll get back to you when I reach my destination. So that's a great thing to set up if you're concerned. You know maybe you're concerned that your your boss is is texting you and and you need to get back immediately. But I think they'll recognize the importance of making sure that you get where you need to be before you respond to them, um, you know, so that you don't cause a crash. Um, you know, and, and, and speaking of which, it's a great thing for uh, employers to, to institute as sort of a policy. If they've got people out on the road driving for work, make it a policy that they set up this do not disturb while driving feature so that they will not, you know, uh, they'll reduce their chance of getting into a crash um, and, and get there safely. I don't know if there's any data on this. Like you said, it's it's hard to know when distracted driving played a part. I'm curious, do you know what kinds of things like people do on their phones behind the wheel? I know I had seen one story of a young woman looking at Snapchat. Um, I heard of another uh, person, I think, online shopping, um, and, and it did not turn out well. Um, I mean, it seems like it's kind of a, what are people doing on their phones? Yeah, it's a great question, and I think it's constantly changing, right? So you, your your phone is always changing. There's new apps and things like that coming out. So, you know, we have seen, you know, we've done some studies looking at kind of trying to understand the demographics of people that are um, engaging in distracting behaviors. And interestingly enough, two uh, groups kind of stood out. One was parents of young children, right? So, and I think that kind of speaks to the fact that you're always multitasking as a parent. We, we found that they were engaged in, um, in things like online shopping and other, 
other sorts of um, you know apps and things like that. The other was gig workers. So these are folks that work for Uber or uh, you know DoorDash. Those sorts of things are constantly checking with their phones. So I have a feeling that those specific apps, you know, were, were causing some distractions. So I think I think it's it's a broad range of things, and that sort of speaks to why the way that distracted driving laws are crafted really matters because a lot of the distracted driving laws out there try to carve out exceptions for different things. But the problem is technology moves very quickly. And so those laws take a very long time to craft. Um, So IHS has done some research finding that laws that have very broad language that essentially say, you can't even hold the phone. You know, it's not even about using it or tapping on it. You can't even hold it. Those laws are more effective because they sort of, you know, they, they get ahead of all of these new sorts of apps and videos and all of those things. But I think we do see a broad range of things from texting, from, uh, you know, even watching videos. You know, I've, I've seen people watching videos on the road. It's very frustrating to see that. But, you know, even typing into their maps function or something like that. So I think it's really important if, if you're using your maps function, which, which can be helpful, get that set up before you start moving the car um, so you aren't looking down at your phone. Do you know um, how many states, I know Ohio's won um, for the past year, I think they had a law in place, they finally started enforcing uh, the kind of hands-free law and they have seen a decrease. Do you know what states have those laws and, and enforce those laws? So, you know, most states have some kind of law in place. Um, I believe if you look at kind of broader laws that that really address sort of just holding a phone, um, it's fewer. I think only about 16 states are currently banning you from holding a phone um, or an electronic device in general. Um, and then other other states do have laws that kind of carve out exceptions or, or point to specific things. So most, most states do have some kind of law in the books. But again, you know, we would encourage lawmakers, you know, that are considering legislation to really think about creating broad broad language that's really going to get people to put down the phone in general rather than, you know, perhaps carving out exceptions for this, that, or the other, um, which can can make it very hard for law enforcement to properly enforce those laws. Anything else? Yeah, just one thing I would just just remind folks that the research is pretty clear that that texting behind the wheel increases your crash risk. Depending how on how old you are, it increases your risk up to about 600%. So if you are considering, you know, responding to that text or, or, or perhaps doing something else on your phone, keep in mind there, that does increase your risk and you're at a much higher risk of, of getting into a crash and possibly injuring or killing yourself or even taking someone else's life. So it's really not worth it. Set that do not disturb function so you're not even tempted by it. Um, you know, and, just, and just really think about making sure you're paying attention to the road. All right. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you speaking with me. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. That was Joe Young with the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, talking about the importance of enabling your Do Not Disturb feature on your smartphone. According to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, distracted driving claimed 3,308 lives in 2022. This accounts for 8% of total fatalities. There was an estimated additional 289,310 people injured in motor vehicle traffic crashes involving distracted drivers. NHTSA says distracted driving is any activity that diverts attention from driving, including talking or texting on your phone, eating and drinking, talking to people in your vehicle, fiddling with the stereo, entertainment or navigation system, anything that takes your attention away from the task of safe driving. The administration says sending or reading a text that takes your eyes off the road for five seconds while driving at 55 miles per hour is like driving the length of an entire football field with your eyes closed. According to the Governor's Highway Safety Association, there are 30 states that prohibit all drivers from using handheld cell phones while driving. All but Alabama and Missouri are primary enforcement laws. An officer may cite a driver for using a handheld cell phone without any other traffic offense taking place. NHTSA says you cannot drive safely unless the task of driving has your full attention. Ensuring your Do Not Disturb feature is enabled is one way to help steer your focus in the right direction. For Landline Now, I'm Ashley Blackford. Stay tuned for more after this.
Penske owns and operates some of the best maintained vehicles on the planet. Our used trucks come with a five-year maintenance report and pre-sale inspection. So if you're in the market for a top quality pre-owned truck, look no further. Search our inventory today at PenskeUsedTrucks.com. Capital Reman, the leader in remanufactured diesel engines and components, has partnered with OOIDA to offer exclusive member benefits. Visit CapitalReman.com today to support America's transportation industry and take advantage of your benefits. When it's time to overhaul your truck engine, help protect it by insisting on a genuine Vibratech TVD crankshaft damper. Heavy duty, absolute premium quality, and they're made right here in the USA. Find a dealer at VibratechTVD.com. Landline Now, welcome back. What's on your driving record? It's important because it can potentially have a huge impact on your career and your ability to make a living. To get some insight into the topic, I had a conversation recently with David Grimes of CDL Legal. So a MVR is your motor vehicle record um, or motor vehicle report. I I think some states might uh, do it a little bit different. But um, what that means is uh, that uh, anytime that you have a license, uh, any of us who drive a car uh, have this MVR. It's held by the uh, state that we live in and drive in, uh, where our license is. And whatever DMV uh, or DMV equivalent uh, organization in that state, uh, that is the organization that keeps the MVR record and uh, will add things to it, um, keep it for you know a certain period of time. And uh, critically for our commercial drivers, um, this is the uh, area where points and uh, penalties can add up over time uh, if you're not careful. Let's talk about the in- information that's going to be on this MVR um, uh, and then kind of get in a little bit more of the weeds on those topics. Uh, I'm wondering if you can kind of walk us through the basic information that's contained there. Sure. Um, so I'll, I'll go briefly. Uh, a lot of commercial drivers are going to have pretty similar uh, MVRs and similar things on them, even if they're from different states. Uh, so it's going to have your personal information. First off, it's going to tell a little bit about who you are, and it's also going to have uh, information on what uh, licensures you have. Uh, so if I have a CDL, it's going to show that. Um and what class and it's also going to have just kind of miscellaneous information like uh for my med card you know if there's any restrictions on my license like wearing corrective lenses it's going to show that as well uh and then the last major component of the mvr will be um the uh violations that you've gotten uh so tickets that were written and then went and were reported onto your mvr crashes same thing and uh, anything having to do with a suspension or uh, revoking a license or part of your license, uh, that will be recorded as well. Uh, so that's just chronological. It'll show over time, like this is what happened, this is when it happened, and this is exactly uh, you know, what the details of it were. Does it contain, uh, for example, information like various endorsements you may have? Uh, sometimes yes. Um, it just really depends on what those are. If it's something having to do with, um, your, uh, ability to drive hazmat, for instance, um, that should be on there as well. Um, but the, the main thing that drivers will, um, encounter and, and deal with as far as their endorsements or certifications is, uh, whether they have the CDL or not the class A and uh, their med card status. Because you have to get uh, that refreshed every once in a while. You've got to get the information um, reassessed by a doctor and the doctor will report it to your DMV and they'll uh, update that information on your MVR. Where a lot of drivers get caught is not caught in the literal sense, but um, where bad things happen is uh, they either miss their um, meeting with the doctor or uh, in some of the reporting, the doctor will send something incorrectly to the DMV or it won't go all the way through. So the driver not knowing anything has happened will just keep on driving, pull into a stop. Uh, The officer takes a look at his license and says, oh shoot, your license is suspended because uh, something happened going wrong with your med card. Um, So whenever, this is just my uh, advice to drivers on this, whenever you get your med card re-upped, 
um, you're going to want to pull a copy of your MVR. Uh, go talk to your DMV and get a copy pulled to make sure that that information got correctly all the way to your MVR. Um, do this like two or three weeks after uh, you get your med card re-upped, and that way uh, you'll be sure that you don't get a nasty surprise uh, in a month or two uh, and have to stop in the middle of a trip. Uh, you mentioned uh, accident history as one of those things in there and, and information about various wrecks you may have been involved in. And I know that that, speeding tickets and so on, uh, most states, maybe all, assign a point value to that. And that that point value and the total of them you have has a lot of effect uh, on your license. But I also know that diff different states have different systems for this. Um, is there a universal way of, of reporting that on the MVR? Uh, does every state do it? their own way or, or give us kind of an idea of how that stuff appears on your record. Definitely. So visually it'll look pretty similar across all MVRs. Uh, it'll just have a chronological history of violations over time and crashes over time. And it'll show um, some sort of point value or strike value uh, depending on how the state assesses violations. Um, so, uh, I think that drivers don't need to try to memorize how things work in every state and how the different state systems talk to each other. That's a lot. Um, the only thing that they really need to worry about is um, what their own state says about tickets. Um, and that's pretty straightforward. You could find it in a Google search most of the time. Uh, either a DMV will have a nice, help, uh, easy to read list or different attorney's offices that work in that state will put things up uh, that you can search for in Google on their own websites. And basically, you'll just want to look and see, OK, how does my state assess the penalties for violations and how does that like stack up over time? Um, usually, you're looking at a certain point value within a period of time. So you're like, OK, if something is two years old or older on my MVR, then it's not adding to my points. I'm safe from that. Um, or it might be something like if I get a moving violation out of state, no matter what it is, uh, that moving violation always, or uh, sorry, a moving violation is say speeding, blowing through a red light, something like that. Um, so that moving violation might translate to my state system as uh, its own category, say two points for any moving violation out of state. Doesn't matter if you were going 25 over the limit or blowing through a school zone or whatever, it all comes through the same. So again, uh, every state is different, like you said, really drivers should just be aware of what their own state says about violations. That way they can know, okay, if I get this ticket in Montana, what is it gonna do to my Florida license? All I have to know is how Florida will translate it, not what Montana says about it. One of the things I think it's important to differentiate here is not only what your MVR contains, but also what it may not contain that people may think is on there. Uh, and one of the ones that comes up are CSA or PSP uh, information. Uh, can you walk us through the difference between the NVR and those systems? Definitely. Uh, so commercial drivers have a lot more to worry about than regular uh, average drivers. Uh, they've got a lot of different things can, that can affect them in different ways. And um, one of those things is DOT inspections, either roadside or at a weight station. Um, those inspections are actually reported to, uh, like you said, your PSP, which is an absolutely separate record from your MVR. Um, so although things on the PSP can affect drivers, and uh, that usually comes into play when they're trying to change jobs or get a new job or something like that, PSP literally stands for Pre-Employment Screening Program. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's really where it mostly comes into play for them. But um, all of those violations that you may get for having a taillight out, having a flat tire, uh, you know, uh, driving without corrective lenses, um, you know, whatever, it could be any number of things um, that show up on a DOT inspection report. Those will not show on your MVR. They don't report there. Um, only things that are tickets and crashes um, will come onto your MVR. We've been talking about how things get onto your MVR a lot here. 
um, and, and what goes on there. But I know a lot of truckers want to know the opposite. How do you get stuff off the NVR once it's on there? Can you walk us through some of the ways that information drops off or can be taken off of your NVR? Mm -hmm. So really, when we're talking about things that are affecting you on your MVR, we're talking about two different things. One, how your DMV penalizes you for violations and that sort of thing. Um, they might have a suspension on you for uh, failing to appear at a court hearing or uh, for even something like failing to pay child support. Um, the DMV can penalize your license um, because we use our licenses for a whole lot of things. Um, they can penalize your ability to drive uh, for a lot of different reasons. So that's one way that, that, that they could be affected. But uh, the other way is just visually. Um, you know, if you're trying to get hired somewhere or if you're trying to uh, make sure that your insurance payments are reasonable and you're shopping around, um, your MVR is going to be pulled. And so um, that can be just visually assessed by a person to say, hey, I see I'm looking at your seven year record and you've been pretty clean for the last two or three years. But, uh, you know, four and five years ago, you had a bunch of violations. Yeah, I, I don't know if I want to hire you or I don't know if I want to insure you. Um, I'm coming around to your question, um, but I am saying, first of all, that um, when things are on the record and they're impacting drivers negatively, it's one of those two things. It might be both together, but it's either those points by the DMV or penalties, uh, or it is the driver's inability to move their career in the way that they want because other people are making assessments on what they see. So getting things off of the MVR is extremely difficult, sometimes impossible. Um, the reason for that is that it's designed to be a thorough record. Um, crashes will not come off unless they are, uh, unless you can prove to the DMV that either you weren't involved in that crash or it shouldn't be reported uh, to your MVR, um, which is almost never the case. Uh, anytime that a crash report is written, um, it's going to go on your MVR, and that's legitimate. Um, and then as far as violations, um, the best way to uh, prevent them um, from, or so the, the best way to prevent them from affecting you is to prevent them from going on in the first place. Once they're on, um, uh, there's usually a, an extremely short fuse that, uh, or maybe a better way to say it would be a narrow window of opportunity um, to maybe get things turned around in court if you can reopen or appeal a case. Uh, and all this is gets very into the legal weeds. Um, but once something has been on for a while, the only way that most states will allow you to pull it off is by an expungement. Uh, which a lot of drivers will explore, uh, especially if you know they're in a desperate situation, they can't get a job because of something that happened years ago. Um, however, expungements are pretty much impossible. Um, they are always a multi-year process. Um, they require specialized legal help, which is usually extremely expensive. Uh, and there's no guarantee that they're even going to work when you start the process. Um, so uh, I know that's sort of a downer answer, but it's almost impossible to get things off once they're on. The best way you can protect yourself is by trying to prevent them from going on in the first place. Get legal help um, and and make sure that you're uh, working to uh, help yourself when you get into trouble on the road uh, as soon as possible. Because once things hit your MVR, they're usually there to stay. I've been having a conversation with David Grimes of CDL Legal, a legal services provider for the trucking industry, about how tickets and citations affect your MVR. You can learn more by calling CDL Legal at 913-738-4836 or by going to their website, cdllegal.com. And you can find all that information on our website, landlinenow.com. Just click on the photo or headline at the top of the page. That's where you'll find all the website links, email addresses, and phone numbers we mention here on the show. Again, that's at our website, landlinenow.com. We'll be back in just a moment with more news and information. Please stay with us through a short commercial break. I'm Mark Reddick, and this is Landline Now. Landline Now. 
If you're running ultra-low sulfur diesel in your vehicle, make sure you are prepared and protected all winter long with Howe's Diesel Treat, the number one anti-gel product in North America from the 100-plus year trusted brand Howe's Products. Truckdown.com. Whenever you have a breakdown, you need Truckdown.com. 24-7 access to 40,000 verified heavy-duty repair vendors nationwide. Owner-operators need roadside speed. Truckdown.com. Firestone tires are for more of everything, with more durability for more miles and more confidence in your fleet. Firestone's tested tires help fleets save with value where it matters most. Learn more at BridgestoneNationalFleet.com slash four more miles. Since you started, what you've loved about trucking is the freedom. Heading out on your favorite route, a good driving song, and thinking about truck insurance. Well, maybe not that last one. That's why we're here. At OOIDA, we have a full range of truck insurance products, expert advice, and great customer service, helping you get the right coverage for your operation. Go to OOIDA.com, because your job is to drive. Our job is to help with everything else. Landline Now, welcome back. If you're hauling freight and running your own business, you need to keep track of some basic facts and figures that can determine whether you succeed or fail. And that includes finding the freight and how much money you can make hauling it. Today, Landline Now's Ashley Blackford will bring us some of that information and get some insight as to why things are happening with the folks from truckstop.com. Here's Ashley Now with a report. Thanks, Mark. And hello to Brent Hutto with Truck Stop. How are you doing today, Brent? Man, Ashley, I'm doing great. It's week 42 in the freight cycle and week 42 in the year as well. And I live in the South. It's an incredible day. It's been an incredible week here because we get about, in Alabama, we get about 10 days of really like perfect weather in the year. <laughs> and this has been like four straight. Yeah, it's been like 70 degrees, no humidity. So it's been fantastic. But now things are good. It's exciting to be in the trucking industry, and, and it, as it is always, but uh, it seems to be especially exciting right now. What? Uh, let's start off by talking about the current market conditions. Yeah, yeah. How are those looking? Things continue to be elevated, and they're, they're being driven in this elevation by a couple of reasons. I think that the theme for this week, Ashley, is over and over, and I'll say this over and over and over again, it's about the rates, it's about the rates, it's about the rates. And so the good thing is, in the last week, we had a really big increase in rates, uh, so I'll talk about that in a second. But the overall pressure in the marketplace continues to stay high, which should be a good thing for owner-operators because the low rates that we've had for almost two years now are continuing to go up. And just to kind of give you an idea, and this is super cool, we, I look year over year. I, I try not to look too far back because if you go three years back, you know, you're going to be disappointed because those don't really relate to the day. But this is interesting. This is super cool. The rates – for the last 14 weeks in a row, yes, 14, one, four, 14 weeks in a row have been above the previous year, and they've been way above in the last three weeks. And granted, a lot of that is the potential port strike and the two uh, natural disasters that the hurricanes that hit that have kind of put some more pressure back in the market, which is making rates go up. Well, what's cool about the rates right now is that or what's good for, for truckers is that the rates continue to kind of go up. But I'll give you a couple of points on this. So the van marketplace went up seven cents. A dollar ninety-three to two dollars. Now, look, these are the posted rates. Remember, please, Mister and Miss Owner Operator, there, negotiate, negotiate, negotiate. Always know how many trucks are in the area that you're going from, that the one that you're going to. Always know these things because you want to negotiate. You want to maximize the rates you're going to, and and you can do that. Even in difficult marketplaces, you can do that. Flatbed increased only one cent, but flatbed was at two thirty-one. Now, week one of this year, flatbed was two twenty-seven. So it's Four cents above the very first week of the year, so that's that's a very good thing. Refrigerated, this is the big one. Refrigerated increased eleven cents from in the last. So, so I'm, the the information I'm giving right now is from last week. So two weeks ago, it's gone up eleven cents. So that's fantastic. Two thirty three to two forty four. So the point here is that man, get when when you are looking for freight. Now, if you're dealing with a broker, you want to look at the market rates and you want to negotiate with the broker that you do business with all the time. But if you're out on the load board. Just know to look, know to continue to look in areas. And the, the big thing here, actually, also on top of this, is that the outbound tender reject index, which is a, a sonar, freight waves measurement, has stayed above 5%. So this is really good for owner operators because when it's above 5%, we get more freight, and we have we get about 5% more freight than normal inside of the freight the spot market. So, But it stayed above 5%. The last three to four weeks, and that's good. So, so it's been trending to stay in that because when it's at five percent or above, we get more 
freight inside the spot market, which means rates continue to go up. And that's really great for an So that's kind of the current conditions on how things are going. So a little bit more optimism than previously. So that's a good thing. What are some of the top regions and lanes from last week? Yeah, you know, actually, I appreciate you always asking that question, too, because, you know, it's, it's one thing to look at the market conditions. You know, we, we all work in certain geographic areas. Truckers can go anywhere, which is a great thing. But you, get, you want to make sure you're looking in, in the areas that are kind of having the best increases because you can maximize your return. And maybe you want to just see that part of the country at this time of the year. You know, so they always talk about going to the Northeast and the foliage, you know, so it's kind of fun. If you're a trucker, you can do anything. It's great. So the load availability in it has increased across the board, except in just one small area, which was the Northeast, even though it saw a rate increase as well. So West Coast, Mountain Central, South Central, Midwest, and Southeast all saw anywhere from a very minor increase all the way up to 13%. So big increases in load availability. When there's more loads availability, rates go up. The rates went up across the board in every region except the South Central, anywhere from about 1.2% to almost 4%. So that, those are big increases. That, that's called profitability in the tank, right? So you always want to make sure you're maximizing the rate because everything you negotiate above you, you know, what, what, what the going market rate is, that's profitability. So one of the big things, too, and I'll talk about this in the, sort of the, the industry points, is that the lanes that are out there, like what lanes have got the biggest rate increases kind of week to week? Everything in van is out of Texas. Houston, Houston, Dallas, Laredo, Laredo, to destinations like Denver, Miami, Amarillo, in interstate, all had big increases. So that's on van and flatbed. We're looking at Denver, Dallas, Chicago, Houston, and Phoenix. So you've seen, as you and I have talked over the last months, these cities have continued to be the, the sort of the highest performers. So when you're looking to maximize your rates, look in those cities on the refrigerated area. You've got Denver, Dallas, Fort Worth, Dallas, Dallas. So Texas, Texas, Texas. So Texas is a very hot market. It's been a hot market. West Coast is is increasing in a hot market as well. I know there's issues with California. We all got issues with California. Not the people of California, just the politics (laughs) of California. (laughs) No, it's always funny. I always have to say it that way because we love the people in California because they're citizens just like the rest of us. But kind of gives you an idea of some increases in areas. What are some important industry points that owner operators should be aware of? Man, I'm you know that's the big deal. Look, what you need to look at as an owner operator to say, okay, how can I enjoy my trucking operation the best? How can I get the best success out of it? And how can I continue to look forward to like what's going to come at me? So the thing that you want to look at right now is that the trade that's going on between U.S. and Mexico continues to increase. No one ever thought that the trade between Mexico would eclipse. China, between China and the United States, but boy has it. The China trade is at $373 billion, billion, billion with a B, <laughs> and the, the, the trade between U.S. and Mexico is 560 almost $200 billion more from Mexico over China. Who would have ever thought that? Here's my point about this, because I talked about all the freight out of Texas. Just You and I talked about that just a second ago. Texas is going to continue to grow and grow and grow at its freight relevance because all this freight is manufacturing – is going to be coming out of Mexico, and it's only going to increase. Just in the last two years, Ashley, over $150 billion has been invested into Mexico manufacturing, some of it by foreign countries like China, but Mexico manufacturing so it can be sent into the United States because all the tariffs and all the things, all the countries know how to play tariffs too. It's my point, though, that all that freight is going to come in. So if you want to grow your business, look for what's going on in Mexico and the United States. A couple other things, and I'll talk about this just in, from a pricing standpoint. Um, there's a big, really, big, really, really big group out there called the uh, Cast Freight Index. Well, the ca- it's the it's the Cast Company. It's really just a big bank. They do they have about 38 billion in freight movement receipts or invoices and those sort of things. So they see a lot of a good good smattering in the marketplace. But it's all they're really really big companies. Here's the good thing: Cast commented that they saw signs of price stabilization. So what does that tell us? Price stabilization in September means what's going to happen at the end of the year. And what's going to happen going into 2025? Because they're a big player when it comes to like forecasting of what's going to happen for rates. And this is what every owner operator should pay attention to. This. What I'm about to say is you're going to see rates continue to increase because they kind of need to and because shippers know that the marketplace has been depressed. They know the rates they've been paying, and they're willing to, to move that price up because they want to make sure they get their goods to the market. And they've got it within their budget to do it. So they're going to continue to move their prices up. You'll probably see a 3 to 5% increase on the, the big fleet end. On the spot market end, you'll probably see more than that because 
we've been at such a low rate for so long. And then, then the impact of like the, the natural disasters in our area have been pretty remarkable. But those are short-lived. But what you want to look at is what's pricing going to do for the next year, likely going to go up because it kind of needs to and because trucking needs it. And, and the, the people that need trucking know that as well. So those are the kind of things that are going on to be aware of. All right, Brent, thank you so much. Oh, my gosh. Thanks for having me. We, we love uh, helping owner-operators, and we love how Ida helps them as well. That was Brent Hutto with Truck Stop. Mark, back to you. Thanks, Ashley. That's our program for today. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Reddick, and this is Landline Now. Thanks for listening. Be sure to like and subscribe. If you want more content, go to landline.media to get updated news, information, and archived editions of our show. Once again, that's landline.media. I'm a dad. A son. A husband. Wife. I'm a writer. Photographer. I farm. I'm a veteran. I love old cars. Fishing. My kids. Chrome. And I am. I am. I am a professional truck driver. And And together, we are OOIDA. OOIDA was founded by truckers to stand up and speak on behalf of truckers. We've done that by combining the individual voices of our members into a single, powerful voice. Protecting your interests, defending your rights. Join us. Make your voice heard. Join OOIDA, the Owner-Operator Independent Drivers Association. Call 1-800-444-5791 or visit OOIDA.com.